Sometimes it's fun to try to say poems in a language that is not really your own. I'm not French, I've learnt French, but I like trying to recite poems in French. So this one is called Le Corbeau et le Renard, and it's by someone called La Fontaine. Le Corbeau is a crow, and the Renard is a fox, and maybe you know this story as The Crow and the Fox, which is an Aesop's fable, and here it is turned into French. Maître Corbeau, sur un arbre perché, tenait en son bec un fromage. Maître Renard, par l'odeur alléchée, lui tint à peu près ce langage. Et bonjour, monsieur du Corbeau, que vous êtes joli, que vous me semblez beau. Sans mentir, si votre ramage se rapporte à votre plumage, vous êtes le phénix des hôtes de ces bois. À ces mots, le corbeau ne se sent pas de joie, et pour montrer sa belle voix, il ouvre un large bec, laisse tomber sa proie. Le renard s'en saisit et dit « Mon bon monsieur, apprenez que tout flatteur vit au dépend de celui qui l'écoute. Cette leçon vaut bien un fromage, sans doute. » Le corbeau, honteux et confus, jaura mais un peu tard qu'on ne l'y prendrait plus. Babysitter. Sometimes my mum and dad used to go out. This meant that my brother had to babysit me. He hated it because I just wouldn't go to bed when he told me to. He was four years older than me. Well, actually, he, he still is. He'd shout. He had rant and rave, will you go to bed? But I never went until I heard the front door open with mum and dad coming back. And then I'd be upstairs into bed in a flash. Anyway, after a few months of this, my mum and dad tried something new. Just before they went out, they said, right Mick, you go to bed before we go out and you stay there. Okay, I said, okay, yeah, okay. And off I went to bed. I lay there waiting to hear the front door close. Slam! And straight away, I was out the bed, down the stairs, into my brother's room. There he is, sitting there, reading. First of all, he tries, I'm not taking any notice of Michael. He goes on reading. I think, I'll make him notice. I put my face behind the book with my eye peeping round the edge of the book. Every time he gets to the end of a line, his eye looks into my eye. He tries to pretend I'm not there. It's no good. He can't. My eye is peeping away like mad round the edge of the book. He starts to laugh. Look, <laughs> yeah, look, 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 he says, look, this isn't fair. You promised you'd stay in bed. I'll tell him. I tell him I will. So now I go and stand by the door and I fiddle. I make little rattly noises with the handle and the key. Fiddle diddle. Riddle diddle. He tries to pretend I'm not there. It's no good. He can't. I'm rattling away like mad with the handle and the key. He starts to laugh. All <laughs> right, he says. Look, right, that's it. He sounds like he's going to really do for me. So now he tries. I'm going to be so boring. Michael will get so fed up. He'll go back to bed. He starts up a chant. Go to bed. 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 He doesn't stop. Go to bed. Go to bed. Go to bed. Go to bed. He goes on for ages. Go to bed. Go to bed. Go to bed. I try to talk to him. Hey, what do you want for your birthday, Brian? Go to bed. Go to bed. Go to bed. Do you want a sweet? Go to bed. Go to bed. Go to bed. Hey, you got a pimple on the end of your nose, you know? Go to bed. Go to bed. Go to bed. And I'm still fiddling with the door. I lock it. I unlock it. I lock it. I try to unlock it. Go to bed. Go to bed. Go. Uh, Brian, um, I can't unlock. <laughs> the door. Go to bed, go to bed. Brian, um, uh, the key's stuck. He stops. Suddenly he looks pleased and he settles down with his book and waits. Meanwhile, I've got big bother. They're going to come back and find me here and I've got out of bed and I've come in his room and I've locked the door and it's really late and it's all my fault. I try and I try and I get that key to work. Fiddle, riddle, diddle, diddle, fiddle, riddle, diddle, diddle. For three hours I'm at it and all the time my brother is not taking any notice of Michael. The front door opens. Hello, my mum calls out. She gets to my brother's door. 
Did Michael stay in bed all right? She's trying to turn the handle. Let us in, Brian, says my dad cheerily. No answer from us inside. My brother is waiting for me to say something. I'm hoping he'll say something. We're looking at each other. Come on, Brian, says my dad, getting a bit cross. Oh no, the moment I dread when dad goes from being cheery to absolutely furious. In a weedy little voice, I say, I lock the door. That really winds them up. There's my mum. Is that you, Michael? You still up? You promised you'd stay in bed. It isn't fair on Brian. And there's my dad and he's roaring. Would you believe it, the little pig? And the door's jammed. I'll have to break it down. God, when I get inside, oh, he's going to be in for big trouble. And me, I'm standing there all shaky and sorry and shuddery. But my brother, what's he doing? He's smiling all over his big face. Yeah, he took the key out passed it under the door and they opened it and I dashed out off to bed faster than an electronic rabbit. When I read books in bed at night, there are things like demons and ghosts. But when mum and dad talk, they use words in another language, Yiddish, that some Jewish people speak. So in my parents' stories, there are people and creatures I never meet in the books. There's um, the schloch. What's a schloch? How do I know about the schloch? Because mum says, huh, don't be a schloch. Sounds bad. She says, you don't want people to think you're a schloch. So I say, what's a schloch? She says, huh, it's what you don't want to be. At night, in bed, I start to think about the schloch. I start thinking what the schloch could be like, this thing that I shouldn't be, but I don't tell anyone because, because when I was a boy, I had a kind of secret life. None of my friends knew that I was worried about the schloch. I figured that if I met the schloch, I'd be in Surus. Do you know what in Surus is? In Surus is like, when you're in trouble, believe me, you didn't want to be in Tsurus. None of my friends knew what it was like when I went to see my grandparents. For a start, I didn't call my grandparents Grandma and Grandad. I called them Bubba and Zayda. No one knew that. No one knew what it was like at their place. Oh, I loved going to visit them apart from one thing. Just one thing thing. Yes, this is how it was. Mum says to us, we're going to Bubba and Zayda's. Come on, Muzik, she says to me. Ah, Muzik. That was another of the words. Ah, this one was a nice one. At night, she'd kiss me and say, good night, Muzik. What's a Muzik? I'd say. Someone nice. A little Russian fella, she'd say. I'm a little Russian fella? Shh, go to sleep now, Muzik. Bubba and Zayda's place was a flat, a ground floor flat. We'd eat uh, plaver, that's a uh, crumbly cake, platzels, freshly baked rolls with sweet chopped herring and latkes. Ah, oh, they're like, a little bit like hash browns. Mmm, and there was the smell of warm bagels that we called bagels. And people are laughing. Zayda shows me the ship in the bottle that sits above the fireplace on the mantelpiece. And it's as if the ship sails along the mantelpiece, on and on and on. We play games, snakes and ladders, fox and geese. If I win, Zayda calls me a knucker. What's a knucker? It means you're clever, but you act like you know it. If I laugh a lot, he tells me our plots. <laughs> plots? What's that? Hey, you're laughing so much, you're plots. You mean wet myself, Zayda? No, like you'll burst, like you'll plots. Why did I say, laugh so much, you'll wet yourself? Now, I need to go to the toilet. But, but, that's the problem. The toilet, the only toilet they had was outside. <gasps> I didn't want to go out there to the outside toilet but I need to go, I have to go, but I don't want to go out there. 
in the dark and cold, all on my own. Not the outside toilet, please. What shall I do? I'll try to hang on. Yes, I'll hang on. You're wriggling about, Mum says. Do you need to go to the toilet? No, I say. You do, says my brother. I think you do, Mum says. You're not scared, are you? She says. No. You are, my brother says. I'm not, I say. So just go, he says. <laughs> he knows I'm scared, but I'm not going to admit it. He knows, and really, I am so scared. I so don't want to go to the toilet, so I hang on. <laughs> I hang on, I hang on. But in the end, I have to go. My brother watches me as I go out of the room, out of the warm living room, through the little kitchen, shadows on the floor, shadows on the walls, out through the back door, into the backyard, into the night. I don't like this. Out here, the chickens are talking. Chirp, chirp, chirp. The night sky goes on forever. The neighbors are groaning into their tea. I mustn't stop. I must go to the toilet and then, there it is, waiting for me. I've got to go in there, but I so don't want to. I can't go back. Over to the dark door, open the door and in. And inside, it's a cave, darker than the sky, colder than the night. This is where the spiders live, creaking up the walls, creaking across the floor, creach, creach, leaving long lines from wall to wall like dusty whiskers that fall in your face. <laughs> the toilet seat is damp. I'll leave the door open, yeah. But who's out there with the chickens? Who's out there? Foxes? Wolves? Beasts that bite? Will they come in and get me? And then, and then, into my head comes the schloch. Here it comes, lumbering in. No, I say, don't come in, please. Go away, leave me alone. I'll call out for help. Ma! But I said I wasn't scared. My brother will say, I said you were scared. The schloch is right there, right in my face. What can I do? What can I do? You know what I am now? I'm in Tsurus. I know. I'll think about something else. What about that thing mum calls me? The muzhik. <laughs> yeah, I'll think of him instead. The muzhik will push the schloch away. Think muzhik, don't think schloch. Think, Muzik, don't think, Schloch. I shut my eyes. Come on, Michael, hurry up. Finish, come on. Finish, and yes, I'm finished. And then it's out of the door, back through the yard, past the chickens, open the back door, it's getting lighter through the kitchen, and ah, the smell of warm bygles into the light, warm living room. All right, says Mum. Were well, you scared? says my brother. Nope. Not even a little bit. Nope. Not a bissel, says Zayda. Hmm. A bissel, I say. My brother winks. Does that mean he gets scared in there too? I smile back. And look, there's Zayda's ship in a bottle sailing down the mantelpiece. There's the game of fox and geese waiting on the table, waiting for Zayda to say, come on, Knacker, I'll play you. And Bubba to say, have another bigel. You must eat. You get ill if you don't eat. And there, on the wall, is the photo of the day Mum and Dad got married. Clever Cakes and Other Stories Cherry Berry Cherry Berry lived with her dad. Her mum had died some time before, and ever since then, things hadn't gone very well. Dad had changed. He had become sad and hopeless and didn't look after her properly. He went out at night, leaving her all alone in the house. Cherry Berry missed her mum and wanted her to come alive again. She kept a picture of her by the side of her bed, and she always remembered something that her mother had told her. One is weak, many are strong. 
She wasn't sure she knew what it meant, but she liked the sound of it. One night her dad was out playing cards with his friends in a little house at the edge of town. This night, like most nights, he was losing. Try as he might, he couldn't win, and he was losing money again and again. He kept saying to himself, if I could win just once, I'd, I'd go home. If only I could win just once. That's all I ask. Then, faster than it takes to swallow a baked bean, a little knobbly man put his head round the corner and said to Cherry Berry's dad, <laughs> you can win all the money you want if you do something for me. And what is it I have to do for you? You must give me the first thing you speak of when you get home, said the little knobbly man. Well, <laughs> that's easily done, said Cherry Berry's dad. He thought how he could walk in at home and say, Ooh, I fancy a nice fresh slice of bread. Or, are we short of carrots? And then he could give the little knobbly man a slice of bread or some carrots. Yes, said Cherry Berry's dad. Now, let's get on with the game. I want to win. So Cherry Berry's dad sat down at the table and sure enough, he won. And he went on winning till the others wouldn't play any more. Now he had more money in his hands than he had seen in years. And he went home a happy man. Cherry Berry, her dad called out. We've got money, my girl. We've got money, no more worries. The moment he said it, he clapped his hand over his mouth, but it was too late to stop the word coming out. He had said it now. What's the matter? said Cherry Berry. She was well used to his strange and reckless ways. Is something wrong? Yes, said her dad. I've done something terrible. A little knobbly man said he could help me win at cards if I gave him the first thing I spoke of when I got home. And the first thing I said was, your name, Cherry Berry. Hmm, I'll have to think of something, said Cherry Berry. And she took herself to bed. In the morning, Cherry Berry said to her father, tell the little knobbly man that the first thing you spoke of was Cherry Berry. It's a girl and she'll be coming in a red dress. So off went Cherry Berry's dad to the little house at the edge of town and he called out, little man, little man, where are you? And a voice came from the house. I'm here. What will you bring me? Cherry Berry said Cherry Berry's dad. And how will I know this? Cherry Berry. She's a girl and she'll be wearing a red dress. Meanwhile, Cherry Berry went off to school to find her friends. Listen, she said, you've got to help me. When morning school's over, run home, change into red dresses and come with me to the edge of town. And that's what they did. Just before 12 o'clock, a long line of girls in red dresses made their way to the house at the edge of town. Suddenly, the little knobbly man appeared and said, <laughs> where's Cherry Berry? I'm Cherry Berry, said the first girl. I'm Cherry Berry, said the second girl. Uh, I'm Cherry Berry, said the third girl. And so on, through all the girls. Bah, shouted the little knobbly man. He rushed away shouting, you won't get away with this. You won't get away with this. Cherry Berry went home. And when her dad got in later, he was delighted to see her. Listen, Dad, said Cherry Berry, you may see the little knobbly man again. If you do, tell him I'll come and I'll be wearing a white dress. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, said her dad. I'm not going back there again. I'm staying here to look after you. But that night, after Cherry Berry had gone to bed, once again, he went off to play cards with his friends in the little house at the edge of town. But no sooner had he sat down at the table to play than out popped the little knobbly man. Why did you play that trick on me? He shouted. Well, I, don't, I did just as you told me to, said Cherry Berry's dad. Make sure she comes tomorrow, said the little knobbly man. How will I know it's her? Um, she'll be wearing a white dress, said Cherry Berry's dad. And she'd better be. 
or you'll be struck down dead. In the morning, Cherry Berry's dad had to tell her what had happened. So later, Cherry Berry and her friends made their way to the edge of town, dressed in white. Out came the little knobbly man again. Who's Cherry Berry? I'm Cherry Berry, said the first girl. I'm Cherry Berry, said the second girl. I'm Cherry Berry, said the third girl, and so on, through all the girls. The little, little knobbly man roared with anger. You won't get away with this. He said, you won't get away with this, and disappeared. Cherry Berry went home, and when her dad got in, he was delighted to see her. Listen, Dad, said Cherry Berry, you may see the little knobbly man again. If you do, tell him I'll be wearing a black dress. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, said her dad. I'm not going back there again. I'm staying here to look after you. But that night, after Cherry Berry had gone to bed, once again... He went off to play cards with his friends in the little house at the edge of town. No sooner had he sat down at the table to play than out popped the little knobbly man. Why did you play that trick on me? He shouted. I, I did just as you told me to, said Cherry Berry's dad. Make sure. She comes tomorrow, said the little knobbly man. How will I know it's her? She'll be wearing a black dress, said Cherry Berry's dad. And she had better be, or your house will fall down with you in it. In the morning, Cherry Berry's dad had to tell Cherry Berry what had happened. But this time, Cherry Berry and her friends didn't go to the house at the edge of town. The little knobbly man waited and waited for her there. And when she didn't come, he rushed down the road with a face like thunder. They won't get away with this, he shrieked. And when he got to Cherry Berry's house, he shouted, Come out! Come out! I want what was promised me! But there was no answer. Right! I'm coming in! And in he rushed. But Cherry Berry and her friends had opened the door in the floor that led down to the cellar. In rushed the little knobbly man and... Down he fell into the cellar, and Cherry Berry slammed the door shut after him. Pfft! The little knobbly man was locked tight in the cellar down below. Let me out! Let me out! shouted the little knobbly man. Oh no, said Cherry Berry. Not you, nor anyone like you. When her dad came home later, he was delighted to see her. I didn't go to the little knobbly man this time, Dad, she said. And what happened? He came here. He was angry because he couldn't have what you promised him. So then what happened? Well, I was angry because you promised him something you never should have promised. So? He's in the cellar. How did he get there? We put him there. So... Cherry Berry and her dad collected up all their things and ran out of the house. The last thing they heard was the little knobbly man shouting, Right! Your house will fall down with you in it! There was a crack and a rumble and a roar. The house fell down and no one ever saw the little knobbly man again. Now, said Cherry Berry, we can go somewhere else to live and start a new life there. Hmm, you're right, said her father, and he promised he'd never go back to the little house at the edge of the town again. And he didn't. Cherry Berry and her father lived together happily in their new home, and Cherry Berry would often look at the picture of her mother by the side of her bed and think of her mother's old saying, One is weak. Many are strong. Well, with me today is Francesca Simon, author of, as you may know, the great Horrid Henry books. Look at that great big stack I've got there, Francesca. Do you think consciously about the idea, I know people who make Hollywood movies think like this, uh, and you know a bit about that because I think your dad was a scriptwriter for yeah, Hollywood, that's right, which is they think what they call jeopardy. 
they think yeah. a peril. Yes. In other words, that even in a comedy, mm. you want a moment where you think, oh no, is that going to happen? Now, do you yeah. think like that with your character? So you've got, what do you want, which you've told us, this motive thing, and then is someone going to help you or is someone going to get in your way and you've got to get them out of the way and that's going to be quite funny. But is there a moment of danger that you want to bring in, which, as I say, the Hollywood people call jeopardy or peril? I'm probably not conscious enough as a writer, but I think instinctively I do that um, because there's always peril. You know, Henry is sneaking downstairs to rob the cookie jar, you could say. So the peril would be, oh, the, the stairs are squeaking. Is someone going to be there ahead of him? How yeah. is he going to avoid being caught? Yeah. I mean, I've watched children as I'm reading them and they're like this. That's what you want. You that's, absolutely that's want. That's the jeopardy. So you want to allow yourself to put your characters in jeopardy. Sometimes I feel a little protective and you've got to just knock that out. This, <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to allow them to experience the danger and the fun. I mean, I mostly write comedy. Yeah, but um, even so, you've, comedy, yeah. danger can be funny. Of course, it yeah. is funny. But also yeah. what makes it also funny is that, in, that Henry wants things so badly. But of course it changes from, from story to story. The thing he wants more than anything in the world is this. And then he's on to the next thing already. Yes. Or yeah. that he doesn't want. There's a shopping one where his mother tries to make him wear, you know, horrible, horrible trousers that he insists are girls trousers and he doesn't want to wear them and they're hor they're checked and horrible and you know I forget even how he gets himself out of this so they they ordinary situations played for laughs but with a kind of deeper idea about yeah about all these sides of 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 kids and about also how you know parents kind of need to look at themselves about mm. not having endlessly talking about criticizing them you know, that, there's, a, that famous, there's a famous story by, Nora, I think it's Nora Ephron, and the whole story is parents criticizing their kids all day <laughs> and saying, have you practiced your cello? Get your elbows off the table. Stop slurping. When are you going to eat your vegetable? And you can, as a parent, I'm sure you can kind of hear that dialogue in yeah. your head where that's literally all you're saying to your kid. But then, of course, with books, you always have to get rid of the parents. Yeah. So, so they, you, with you, that you get rid of them and then they come back in again at, at various moments because they're yeah. they're present. But that's what one reason Moody Margaret lives next door to Horrid Henry because she's his big enemy and nemesis. And that way they can have the freedom to jump over the walls of each other's gardens. Otherwise, yes. you know, Henry's pretty young. He wouldn't just run out the front door and run across town. So if she lives next door, they can have a lot of interactions without the parents supervising. Very good. Very neat. Francesca Simon. Thanks ever so much indeed. Thank you. That's lovely that Thank you, you came Michael. and talked to us. Now, it would be great if you subscribed. That is, you become a subscriber. Look out for the subscribe button. What happens, you see, is that I make new vids every few months and then I post them up one a week. So if you subscribe, you get to see the new ones just as they come hot off the press. Eww.